My name is Kyle, and I just thought today I might do a video on uh, the topic of God and evil. Seeing as how many people, especially these days, are asking or questioning why it is that something like evil can exist in a world where someone like God, who is supposed to be perfectly good, also exists. Now, I know some people might be thinking that we should not really be using philosophy as theologians or Christians, and that philosophy is, like, evil or wicked. Philosophy is evil and wicked. Get your pitchforks and your torches. That being said, philosophy and logic and just everything about it plays a fundamental role, especially in theology and the scriptures itself. So let's get right into this topic and get down to the meat of the subject. So from helpless fawns burning to death needlessly in the woods to hurricanes savagely wiping out entire civilizations, humanity has often raised one of the quintessential questions, if God is omnibenevolent, how then can evil exist? Many Christians have often responded to this question by quoting James chapter 1 verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself is not tempt anyone, thus denying that God is the source of evil's existence. Though this answer does vindicate God from being the source of evil, it has left many individuals unsatisfied due to the lack of an explanation for the source of evil. If God is not the creator of evil, then humanity is responsible for evil's existence, or had always evil has always existed. Before we can answer these questions, we first need to understand what is evil. Only once we have successfully defined evil can we then address the problem regarding the existence of evil in a universe that has been created by an omnibenevolent being. In the end, after examining the confessions of St. Augustine by St. Augustine of Hippo, or more specifically Augustine's privation perversion theory, it will be indisputable that though evil in essence cannot exist, that which could be best defined as evil can exist merely because it is a perversion of pre-existing good material. Before we examine Augustine's privation perversion theory regarding the existence of evil, we need to understand why it is that evil cannot exist in essence. To do this, I will first examine Epicurus's logical problem of evil. 1. If an omnibenevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient God exists, then evil does not exist. 2. There is evil in the world. 3. Therefore, an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God does not exist. This argument is of the logical valid form of modus tollens. Not that you really need to know that, but it's there if you need to. Now, since it is unclear precisely how the antecedent of the first premise of Epicurus's argument entails the consequent, later philosophers have offered refinements such as 1. God exists. 2. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. 3. An omnibenevolent being would want to prevent all evils. 4. An omniscient being knows every way in which evils can come into existence. 5. An omnipotent being who knows every way in which an evil can come into existence has the power to prevent that evil from coming into existence. 6. A being who knows every way in which an evil can come into existence, who is able to prevent that evil from coming into existence, and who wants to do so, would prevent the existence of that evil. 7. If there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent being, then no evil exists. 8. Evil exists. This is obviously a logical contradiction due to the fact that if an omnibenevolent being such as God exists, it therefore would conclusively follow 
that evil cannot exist. Since evil does exist, it therefore must follow that an omnibenevolent being such as God cannot exist. In addition, Epicurus' logical problem of evil, the Christian theist would be committed to four inescapable conundrums, provided they persist to maintain the notion of evil as an essence. Now, one, God is the creator of evil, and because nothing which is omnibenevolent can create evil, God therefore is not omnibenevolent, as well as is corruptible. Two, humanity is the creator of evil, and therefore is also capable of bringing things in and out of existence. Three, evil caused itself to exist out of nothing, thereby contradicting the law of efficient cause which states that nothing can cause nothing to exist. Or four, evil has always existed and is the sustainer of its own existence. Now, the Christian theists cannot commit themselves to any of these problems, not one, not two, not three, not four, as each one contradicts John chapter 1, verse 1, Romans chapter 4, verse 17, James chapter 1, verse 13, and 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. You can look those up on your own time. <laughs> as previously stated, though, these problems are inescapable as long as the Christian theist continues to believe that evil is an essence. The argument comes down to either God exists and essence is evil does not, or essence evil exists and God does not. Because it is apparent that essence evil exists, the Christian theist must submit to Epicurus's conclusion that an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God cannot exist. So why are these four conundrums a problem for the Christian theist, and why are they unavoidable? Well, if you examine Psalms 100 verse 5, it is taught that God is omnibenevolent or infinitely perfectly good. Furthermore, God cannot commit any acts of evil as expressed through James chapter 1 verse 13. So if God is perfectly good and God cannot commit acts of evil, how can it be possible for God to create evil? In order for God to create evil, God must be capable of evil itself. And if God is capable of evil, then God is not omnibenevolent. So if humanity is the creator of evil, would it not become possible for humanity to bring other things in and out of existence? If humanity is capable of bringing one thing into existence, then there is no reason to believe humanity can't bring other things into their own existence. Though humanity was created in God's image and was given permission to take part in creation by naming all the different animals of the earth, as shown in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, God was, as well as is, the only one who can bring things in and out of existence, as stated in Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, it becomes impossible for humanity to create essence evil. Now, regarding conundrum 3, though I have already established that evil's self-causation is an impossibility, it must also be understood that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This verse does not imply that evil existed alongside God, but that the temporal spatial creation ever and ever existed, yet only God existed. So before the temporal spatial creation existed, only God did. Now, I know that phrasing, temporal spatial creation, is going to throw a lot of people off and they're like, what on earth is that? Um, so I'm going to just briefly explain what that is because I know if I don't, I'm going to hear it from my wife. <laughs> so, the temporal spatial creation is merely just the plane of existence that is bound to by the rules of both time and space. It is everything that is created and is bound by the laws of limitation or a finite nature. So I'll reread this again back to uh, the, the verse at the very top here, and then we'll get back to the temporal spatial creation part. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
This verse does not imply that evil existed alongside God, but before the temporal spatial creation ever existed, that only God existed. Therefore, the Christian theists cannot commit themselves to the fourth conundrum as it contradicts John chapter 1, verse 1. So why are these four conundrums inescapable for the Christian? Because if the Christian commits themselves to evil as an essence, they must provide an explanation for the existence of evil, which is either God created it, humanity created it, evil caused itself to exist, or evil just always existed. Now, what exactly is it I mean by the term essence evil? To give it a brief definition, that which is essence evil is by nature a force which is naturally evil. It is completely devoid of good. It exists separate from the will of God, I mean, well, of God and of good, opposes the will of good, and has a will of its own. In other words, when I use the term essence evil, I mean something that is of its very essence not good. It is a contradiction of and opposite to that which can be defined as good. Some forms of essence evil have been referred to as natural evil, such as unnecessary or intense suffering and harm which comes from the natural world and that way that things are made rather than through any human agency. For example, the pain of childbirth, the suffering and loss caused by earthquakes or droughts or by congenital health problems such as cystic fibrosis and the fact of death itself. In other words, this natural evil is meant to exemplify essence evil through forms of suffering, which is not a direct result of free acts of human beings. And this is displayed in William Rowe's famous example of natural evil, such as instances of intense suffering, which an omnipotent, omniscient being could have prevented without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse. For individuals similar to William Rowe, Situations of senseless destruction or intense suffering that could have prevented, been prevented by God are forms of essence evil. Now, if we re-examine Epicurus's logical problem of evil, the only logical solution for the Christian theist is to deny that essence evil even exists. In order to accomplish this, whilst fashioning an explanation for actions and attributes defined as evil, St. Augustine argues that God created the universe out of nothingness and not from pre-existing material. Due to the fact that God is omnibenevolent, God cannot create anything that is evil. This is not suggesting that everything God created is good like him, but that existence itself is good. And because anything that exists is good, as a result of God's acting, everything God creates must be good. Thus, because everything God creates is good, it therefore follows that everything in creation is by definition good. Furthermore, Augustine argued that instead of evil existing independently from good, evil as a privatio bonae, privation of good, was really a defective good and imperfection and could not exist apart from goodness. My apologies to anyone who actually knows what the Latin of uh, bravadio bonae is, because I, I know I'm pretty sure I butchered that. Um, so the fact is that the very notion of evil nature or essence is a contradiction in terms. For evil itself cannot be a substance. Otherwise, it would be then good by definition. Additionally, as previously stated, God cannot create evil as it would contradict his omnibenevolent nature. Though God's omnibenevolent nature prevents him from creating evil, Augustine believed that the law of non-contradiction did not apply to the antithesis of good and evil, both of which would exist in the same thing at the same time. Indeed, evil could not exist apart from good, so, even though good could exist without evil, where there was no good, there was no evil either. In other words, though that which is good can exist without evil, evil cannot exist without good. Now, some philosophers advocated that the definition of evil is that 
it is a necessary and equal counterpart of good as they both require each other in order to exist. This form of theology, which completely opposed Augustine's privation and perversion theory, was the Manichaean theology of absolute and uncompromising cosmological dualism. According to the Manichaeans, good was either everywhere locked in eternal conflict with evil, light contended against darkness, spirit was opposed by evil matter, good and evil were absolutely separate with no morally gray areas in between, presiding over the field of battle where two principles, one good and the other evil. Moreover, the Manichaeans identified the evil principle with God of the Old Testament, who as creator of matter and flesh was the author of evil, and responsible for such moral enormities as the whoring polygamy, lying and killing by the patriarchs and the prophets. By contrast, the good principle, the father of the greatness, tended to be linked with the more spiritual God as portrayed in the New Testament. This, however, contradicts John chapter 1, where it explains that the God of the New Testament is exactly the same God as the Old Testament. In the end, Augustine claims that rather than be a thing or an essence, evil must be a perversion of God's will for pre-existing material in the temporal spatial creation. Furthermore, Augustine previously stressed that though it is necessary for good to exist in order for that which is defined as evil to exist, it is not necessary for the existence of evil in order to have the existence of good. Now, a response that could be made regarding the last two paragraphs is, if it is not a contradiction for evil and good to exist in the same thing at the same time, why is it a contradiction for God to be evil or create evil? To answer this, the first portion of this question, we need to examine what is known as the Euthyphro's Dilemma. This problem forces the Christian theist to decide whether God objectively created morality and is capable of changing morality to suit his subjective agenda, or that morality always existed before God, thus inferring there is a being greater than God. However, the Christian theist should recognize that the Euthyphro dilemma is merely a form of a false dilemma. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the philosophical term false dilemma or false dilemma fallacy, it is the idea that um, something can be presented in an argument, but the argument does not include all the possibilities. It locks you in to only a few options and does not include an exception. And for this reason, because it locks you into options that do not include a possibility for a way out, it is referred to as a false dilemma. Now, rather than God creating morality and commanding it, or morality existing before God and then commanding it, morality and command are infinitely intertwined within God's nature. Therefore, God's will is infinitely constant. And that which is defined as evil is a perversion of God's will. It therefore becomes impossible for God to commit or create anything that is defined as evil. Now someone could respond with Isaiah 45 verse 7 from the King James translation and claim it proves God made evil as a part of his creation. I form the light and I create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. However, the New American Standard Bible, my favorite translation, also known as the literal Hebrew and Greek translation, provides a clearer sense of Isaiah 45, verses 6 through 7. There is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Now, in other words, God devises calamity as a judgment for the wicked, an example 
would be the destruction God brought upon Sodom and Gomorrah for their continued sinful wickedness. However, this destruction or calamity was not an evil vengeance, but a righteous judgment. Now, one particular philosopher known as Stanley Kane argues against Augustine's view of evil in his article, Evil and Privation, by stating evil is real, but that it has a positive nature of its own, that it exists in its own right independently of the existence of anything else. Now, the reason Cain takes this approach is because he holds that Augustine's theory is unmistakably inadequate to express a limb aching with pain as suffering merely as a privation of good health or normal feeling. Instead, Cain explains, expresses that when anything painful occurs in the body, there is something new and different in a person's experience which would not be present when the privation of sensation for a body would simply be the loss of feeling. However, pain is something more than merely a departure from the state of normal good health. That is so can be seen by once again comparing a limb that is paralyzed with one that is aching in pain. Furthermore, Cain argues that having throbbing pain in a finger which as a consequence is unable to feel and function normally is considerably worse, i.e. more evil, than having a finger that is unable to feel and to function. In other words, Cain disputes that through Augustine's privation of good theory that the greatest evil possible for sensation is lack of sensation, or numbness. However, pain considerably a greater evil, and therefore anyone in constant pain is experiencing a greater evil than what is causing by the privation of good. Now finally, Cain argues that under Augustine's privation of good theory regarding sins of omission and commission, that the Christian would fatally be committed to the notion that all sins are equally evil, and that as evil, there is really nothing in the hateful or murderous acts beyond the lack of privation of love and right action. Now, regarding Cain's argument of having a throbbing finger argument is completely subjective argument. Perhaps constantly living in throbbing pain is worse than having lack of sensation. However, it is not necessarily the case that this is therefore a greater evil. For example, Imagine if person X was a masochist and thrived from the sensation of throbbing pain. Then they would forever be in a state of subjective heaven in comparison to someone who is in an internal state of numbness. Furthermore, Cain's concern regarding Augustine's theory consequentially entailing that all sins are equally evil is not a problem for the Christian theist. Sin, by definition, is everything contrary to God's infinitely perfectly good nature, and therefore sin is in fact an infinite crime. If sin were not an infinite crime against a perfectly infinitely good being, it therefore becomes possible for someone like Adam, had they not sinned, to be the perfect penal substitution for the sins of humanity. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term penal substitution, it is merely the means in which theologians, many theologians, just all theologians for that matter, des describe the way in which Christ himself was the sufficient means to appease God's wrath as well as the punishment for the crime of sin. Now, some Christians might argue that there are gradations of infinite sins, and there would therefore be gradations of infinite punishments, as is supposedly expressed through Matthew 18.6. If we examine Matthew 17.21-23, through 23, it is here that the scriptures convey there will be those who believe they taught the truth, but instead led others astray, and therefore would suffer in hell believing they are being unjustly punished. This is not objectively a greater level of punishment, but subjectively. Furthermore, though we can draw infinites to appear different in both size and shape, the reality is that by nature, if anything 
infinite were actualized, they would all constantly be equally at their greatest potential. This was stated by uh, Aquinas. To suggest that there are greater levels of infinites forces the Christian to concede that in an infinite number of universes the potentiality exists there could be a being who is infinitely greater than God. For the Christian this is impossible because they as a Christian must believe that God is the greatest conceivable being as well as the only true infinite. As for Cain's desire to focus on Augustine's privation of evil theory, his understanding of Augustine's definition of evil is incomplete, thereby misrepresenting Augustine and committing a straw man fallacy. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term straw man fallacy, the idea of a straw man fallacy, under a really crude simplification, is just that um, you take someone's argument and you misrepresent that argument, and then you tear down the misrepresentation of that argument and say, I won! Now, after examining the Confessions of St. Augustine by St. Augustine of Hippo, Augustine explains, and I asked what wickedness was, and I found that it was no substance but a perversion of the will bent aside from thee. In other words, although, I mean, although through Augustine's definition of privation concerning the existence of evil concluded that evil in its essence cannot exist, Augustine does not clarify, sorry, Augustine does clarify that which could be defined as evil can exist merely because it is a perversion of God's will for pre-existing good material. Now, some individuals may compare what they believe to be different forms of greater potential infinites using different multiplications of progressing numbers. However, this is merely a representation of an infinite progressing and is by definition not a true infinite. A counterpoint these individuals could make is by stating that these numbers are both progressing and regressing infinitely at the same time at the same rate. However, according to the definition of an actual infinite, it must be limitless or endless in space, extent or size, impossible to measure or calculate, as well as incomprehensible. As a result, a true infinite cannot be represented by any numbers as they are measurable digits. Furthermore, if something by nature is a true infinite, the distance between these two numbers is irrelevant, because the space between each number is infinite, therefore making it impossible to reach the next number. This renders any example employing the use of numbers to represent infinity ineffective. In the end, in order for an infinite to be truly actualized, it must be limitless or endless in space, extent, or size. This eliminates the use of numbers to support any theory that suggests there are infinitely greater forms of actual infinites. Now, why is it that in existence only God can be a true infinite? First, it must be understood that anything which exists and is bound by the temporal spatial creation must require a first cause. This is expressed through the Kalam cosmological argument, where it says, 1. Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. 2. The universe began to exist. And 3. The universe has a cause of its existence. Though many scientists and most theists would agree to this conclusion, the dispute over what first cause was has led to three different opposing theories. One, the universe caused itself to exist. Two, the universe always existed. Or three, the universe was caused to exist. Now, according to the law of efficient cause, which states nothing can cause nothing to exist, 
it stands to reason that the universe causing itself to exist from nothingness is impossible. The reason for this without pre-existing material, the universe would not exist consciously or unconsciously. In order to begin its own existence, as for the universe always existing, this does not explain how the universe came to being. Rather, it just asserts the universe always existed. However, this theory is insufficient due to the fact that it results in a homunculus fallacy, or an infinite regression fallacy. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term homunculus fallacy, or infinite regression fallacy, it is an argument that accounts for a phenomenon in terms of of the very phenomenon that is supposed to explain, which results in an infinite regress. Now an example would be antecedent universe cosmologist who affirms that the Big Bang was a rebound from a collapsed big crunch of an antecedently existing universe. It was caused by an influx of energy from pre-existing from a pre-existing world. However, rather than the universe having a first cause, it just infinitely expands and contracts, or goes through infinite cycles of big bangs and big crunches. Although this theory does explain how the universe may continue to exist, it does not explain how the universe came to be. Now, one could ask why the universe is infinitely existing which results in an infinite regress, is necessarily a problem. First, if the universe has infinitely existed, then time must also be infinitely occurring at an infinitely immeasurable rate. Therefore, if time were an actual infinite, then a question one should raise is how we arrived at the current date. If time were truly infinite, then there would be an infinite number of dates regressing backwards. Thus, arriving at the current date would be impossible. However, we are at the current date. So, how did we get here? Now, time could be potentially a progressive infinite, but it could never be realized. In the end, since the definition of an actual infinite demands it to be limitless or endless in space, extent, or size, impossible to measure or calculate as well as incomprehensible, even if the potentiality exists that time could progress infinitely, time cannot regress infinitely, and therefore would not be an actual infinite. So, why is it that in existence only God can be a true infinite? If the temporal spatial creation is finite, then everything bound to the temporal spatial creation must also be finite. So, is it even possible for God to be infinite? First, it must be understood that only everything which dwells in the temporal spatial creation is therefore bound by the laws of being limited through a finite nature and requires a first cause. However, God dwells within the spirit realm, which is beyond the perception of our physical senses. I am not suggesting that God is fictional but it is a matter of God not being restricted by the physical laws and dimensions that govern our world, which is expressed through Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Furthermore, if you examine Psalms chapter 90, verse 4, Moses himself used a profound analogy for illustrating the timelessness of God. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday. It passes by, or as a watch in the night. The eternalness of God is differentiated with the temporality of man, where humanity's lives are brief and fragile, like the flicker of a flame. God is neither brief nor fragile with the passing of time. As a result, time is irrelevant to God due to the fact that he transcends it. After examining 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, you'll notice that Peter warned his readers not to allow this critical fact to escape their sight. For it is crucial to understand that God's perspective of time is far different than humanity's, as seen in Psalm 102, verse 12, and 102, verses 24 through 27. Unlike humanity, God is outside 
of the sphere of time, and therefore observes, observes all of eternity's past, present, and future. This is seen in Ecclesiastes 3.15. Now, due to humanity's finite mind, humanity can only grasp the concept of God's timeless, infinite existence through finite spectacles, if you will. As a result, humanity describes God without a beginning or end, eternal, infinite, everlasting, and more. For God always was, always is, and always will be. Psalm 90, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So when Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says God created the heavens and the earth, it is conclusive that God is not just the only true actual infinite, but that he is the necessary and only sufficient first cause of the temporal spatial creation. If evil does not exist, and that which is defined as evil is a perversion of God's will, what then is a perversion of God's will? And the answer to that is sin. As John Rawls explains in his book, A Brief Inquiry into the Meaning of Sin and Faith, sin is neither a substance, being, spirit, or matter. So it is technically not proper to think of sin as something that was created. Sin correspondingly to Augustine's explanation for that which can be defined as evil is simply a lacking of moral perfection and is a perversion of God's intended will. Fallen creatures such as human beings are themselves responsible for their sins, and all evil in the universe originates from the sins of the fallen creatures. Now, someone might respond to this definition by asking, how does this definition of that which is defined as evil account for all the forms, natural disasters, and intense suffering? If you inspect Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it, is, it indicates that death entered the world because of sin. All of the death, pain, illnesses, exhaustions, forms of calamity, and everything that is terrible, wicked, that happens, it all happens as a result of sin entering into this universe as shown in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 24. So as long as sin remains within this universe, then all the effects of sin, such as the different forms of calamity that are caused by sin, will continue to work within this universe. So, in the end, if the Christian theist maintains to define evil as a type of essence, they are therefore committed to four fatal problems. One, God is the inventor of evil, and due to the fact that nothing which is omnibenevolent can create evil, God therefore is not omnibenevolent as well as is corruptible. Two, Humanity is the author of evil and therefore is also capable of causing things to exist as well as could be the sustainer of their own existence. 3. Evil caused itself to exist out of nothingness and can cause nothing to exist. Or 4. Evil has always existed, is the sustainer of its own existence, and therefore could be equal to God. As a result, the Christian theist must concede to the Epicurus's conclusion that an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God cannot exist, provided essence evil also exists. In order to avoid this calamity, the Christian theist must employ Augustine's privation perversion theory, which explains that even though evil in essence cannot exist, that which could be best defined as evil, sin, can only exist because it is a perversion of pre-existing good material. Now I hope you find this video and the topic itself um, interesting, but what I also hope for you personally on both an intellectual and spiritual scale is that your desire to delve deeper into the scriptures becomes inflamed that your desire to go deeper, to understand more, to see more than just the surface level has 
been inflamed, that you want more, that you crave more. And that's what's important about this. Philosophy and theology isn't something that we should that we should fear or that we should hate or see as something that goes against our spiritual growth, but something that can aid it. That's something that can help us not only grow personally and spiritually, but something that we can use to help explain things further for others whom we want to see build a strong connection with God. So after watching this video, I hope that you feel encouraged to not only understand the subject matter of even God and evil, but of other complicated subject matters that have been brought up by so many people, whether they are believers or not. So I will be doing more videos like this for the future, but I hope for now that this is enough.